Today we're going to talk about section 3.4, which is the principles of reliable data transfer. All right, so this whole section is about how can we, in a sort of generic way, how can we transfer data from one point to another point and make sure that all the data actually gets there in a reliable way. We can, we can depend on the communication. Um, and this question is made even more difficult and more interesting when the communication uh, layer is unreliable. When the link between the two endpoints is unreliable, when it may lose packets or duplicate packets, how do we make sure that we actually get data transferred reliably over that link? All right, so let's um, look at this at a high level first. This shows the application layer at the top where there's a sending process and a receiving process and to them they know that they send data, they push it down, the sending process pushes it down, it's moved over a reliable channel and then delivered to the receiver process. The same piece of data that was sent. The transport layer has the job of implementing this protocol to create a reliable channel. And this is what the service looks like. All right? It looks like we're pushing data over a reliable channel. In actuality, we have to send the data over an unreliable channel. So how do we get reliability over an unreliable channel? That's the basic question of this whole section. Um, and we're going to discover some principles kind of incrementally that answer that. So when we have an unreliable channel, how do we do this? This is a diagram from the book that tries to illustrate this, and hopefully this makes some sense. All right, step one, um, if we can zoom in on this, on the sending side, is we're going to, the application layer is going to send the data reliably. This RDT send is an abstraction of the idea of a, a method, a function that does reliable data transfer send. All right, so it's going to, we're going to call this method RDT send, and it's going to implement the reliable data transfer protocol on the sending side. Underneath that, that data is actually going to be broken up and sent over an unreliable data transfer send because that's what our channel is. Our channel is unreliable. So the data gets passed in from the application layer to the transport layer, which implements RDT send over UDT send. The data actually gets sent over the channel unreliably, and on the receiving side, there's a reliable data transfer receive, RDT receive, and that's called when the packet arrives on the receiver side of the channel. Now this RDT receive may have to be called multiple times for the same packet to make sure the packet finally gets through. But it is going to reliably receive it and deliver it to the top of the transport layer, which is going to do this data deliver, deliver data function, which will pass the data up to the application in a reliable way. What questions do you have about this process? So we have RDT send, UDT send, we have the RDT receive, and then the deliver data. So those four steps are at a very high level how we're going to implement reliable data transfer over an unreliable channel. Questions on this? So what we're going to look at throughout the rest of this section is what goes on inside this blue box and this green box. What's the magic that's going on in there that allows <clears throat> the, this series of kind of function calls to be implemented? The way the book explains this uses finite state machines um, where there are certain states that the protocol is in if certain events happen, he does event over action. So when an event happens, these actions occur, and we may move between states. Um, I don't love this description, and we will draw these out in a slightly different diagramming style. Uh, but this is a very compact way of explaining a system and how it changes states based on events. What we're going to do is incrementally develop 
a reliable da uh, data transfer protocol. So we're going to start with something very, very simple and add a problem and then solve it. Add another problem, solve it. Add another problem, solve it. And in the end, we're going to end up with a protocol that can handle a very unreliable channel and get the, the data across reliably. And we will use that then in the next section to talk about how TCP does the same thing using similar principles. All right, so here is our first version of the protocol, RDT 1.0. In this example, we're going to assume that the underlying channel is perfectly reliable. All right, so this is reliable data transfer over a reliable channel. And if you think about what's going on here, you realize that this is sort of dumb, right? This is, we have removed the problem that we were trying to solve. Um, to be very specific about it, there are no bit errors, so packets won't be corrupted, and packets won't be lost either. So these are the two kinds of problems we're going to be looking at and trying to solve. How does it work? On the sender side, it's going to wait to receive a data packet from the application layer, and when it gets it, it's going to make the packet, and it's going to send the packet. It, when it does this UDT send, we know that since that UDT send actually happens over a reliable channel, the packet's never going to be corrupted or lost, so we'll always be able to deliver the data to the application layer um, by extracting the packet and then delivering the data. So really, this is, this, is, this is our baseline starting case where there aren't problems. Okay. Let's take it up a notch to RDT 2.0. In this case, we're going to assume that the underlying channel may cause bit errors to happen. So the channel is unreliable, but it's only unreliable in the sense that bit errors can happen. Meaning, I've sent a one and I receive a zero in that bit position. In this case, all the packets are still delivered. Packets cannot be lost, only they can only be corrupted. Okay, so how do we detect errors? How do we detect that a packet was corrupted. Some ideas for y'all. Checksum. Checksum. Right, so let's use an algorithm like a checksum that adds some additional information to the packet um, and then we can check it on the other side and confirm but using that same algorithm that we got the same packet that was sent. Alright, so we've solved that problem but now we have another question. If we detect that there's an error, what do we do? Okay, so Zeke says we need to get that packet again. We need to ask the sender to resend it because the one that we got is, is corrupted. So the general answer to this is we need some feedback from the receiver. We need to be able to allow the receiver after he's computed the checksum, to send back a message to tell the sender either number one, I got the packet okay, or number two, I didn't get the packet okay. The packet was corrupted. And the name of these messages that we uh, that say this, that send this message, are acknowledgments, negative acknowledgments, acts, and acts. Um, So the new mechanism that we've introduced here is receiver feedback. So the receiver can send back an ACK or an ACK. Um, and then secondly, the sender has to be able to retransmit the packet. Makes sense, but he, he, has to, he has to understand that part of the protocol too, that if he gets a NAC, he needs to resend the previous packet. If he gets an ACK, He'll send the next packet. So what we have developed here is RDT 2.0, and this is called a stop and wait protocol. You can imagine how this would work. The sender is going to send a packet, and it's going to wait until it receives an ACK or an ACK. If it, rece if it receives an acknowledgment, it'll send the next packet. If it receives a negative acknowledgment, it'll send the same packet again. But it's very much they're in lockstep. It's always going to be receiver, sender, send, receiver, acknowledge. Receiver, um, 
send or send, receive or send, back and forth. Um, so what I'm going to ask you to do in your homework is to think about these scenarios using RDT 2.0. What would this look like for a sender receiver, if there are no errors, to go back and forth implementing this protocol? Um, and the same for with errors. What does it look like if there are errors for the sender and receiver to implement RDT 2.0, which uses a checksum and receiver feedback? That's AX and NAX. All right. We'll come back to this and talk about this some more later. Um, RDT 2.0 has a fatal flaw, though. All right. There's, there's an assumption that we've made that's invalid that would really cause us some trouble. What is the fatal flaw? How is it that we might still send data unreliably in this scenario? You get multiple packets and don't know which one are. Um, how can we get multiple packets? We're only ever going to be able to get the packet, the current packet or the next packet. So if we get them out of order? Um, how could you get them out of order? Well, we're assuming that none of them can be lost in this scenario for RDT 2.0. Is unreliable speeds, or well, this is still this is this is completely reliable. So the only kind of problem that can occur in this scenario is packets can be corrupted, and we said if the data packet's corrupted then we'll send a negative acknowledgement. If it's not corrupted, we'll send a positive acknowledgement, an act. So what's the situation we haven't considered? What if the acronym is corrupted? That's the problem. What if the acronym is corrupted? Let's walk through that. All right, so if the sender gets back an acknowledgement and that acknowledgement is corrupted, what should we do? What if it was an acknowledgement? Then the Second receiver is, ex is expecting to receive the next packet, but instead it receives the first packet again. So it's the same, it's the yes. All right, so our question, what happens if the app or NAC is corrupted? The problem is the sender doesn't know what happened at the receiver in that case. And that's a problem because he has to do two different things depending on if, if it was an ACK or an ACK. He can't just retransmit because if he just retransmits, then he could create a duplicate packet at the receiver. But the receiver doesn't know it's a duplicate. Right? It, to the receiver side, it thinks that the sender knows what's going on and it sent the next packet and it's going to um, start just continue accumulating packets. So the, the issue we have here is that we can have duplicates and we need to do something to handle them. What can we do to make sure that duplicates can be identified? So on the quiz today, sequence number. Does that make sense? So if we're going to uniquely identify each packet, we can put a number on it and then we'll know at the receiving side if I get packet zero and then I get another packet zero, then the sender must think that I sent a NAC. So he's resending the packet. But I can tell that it's a duplicate because it has an ID number on it, a sequence number. Does that process make sense? Um, so in that case, the receiver, if it gets a duplicate packet, what should it do with it? Right, just discard it, throw it away, even though the sender doesn't know that the receiver already had it. The receiver knows that, and he's going to throw it away. Um, so again, this is still a stop and wait protocol where we send one packet and then wait for a response from the receiver. Send one packet, wait for a response. And we're always going to send either this packet or the next packet. All right, so RDT 2.1 implements this thing we've just talked about. It's going to implement sequence numbers in order to solve the problem of duplicates. Does that make sense how we identified a problem, which is duplicates are possible if the app or NAC is garbled, is corrupted? 
the problem is duplicates might exist, and the solution is add a sequence number to the packet. All right, now a question we have, it, it, based on this protocol, how many sequence numbers do we need to, to implement it? You say two. What do you think? That's a pretty small number. Lance, you got any agree, disagree? Just going to hold out? Why do you say two, John? It only needs a zero or one, but I'm glad that you did. You I did you see that from the book, or did it did it make sense to you? It made sense to me. But okay, good. That is correct. We only need two sequence numbers: a zero and a one, um, and that's what I've got here. Why? The why is this is a stop and wait protocol. These guys are in lockstep with each other and the sender can only ever send the current packet or the next packet. He can't ever get two ahead because there can only be one packet out at a time. Does that make sense to you? Right, so either the only two answers that the receiver can send back are I got that packet correctly, send the next one, or I didn't get that packet correctly, send it again. So the only two packets that the receiver is ever interested in getting are the packet that was just sent, being resent, or the next packet. It can't ever get two ahead. Do, do you believe me? Do you, does it make sense why the two sequence numbers would be enough? Okay, so the other thing the sender has to do is it has to be able to check the acknowledgement or negative acknowledgement to see if it's corrupted. Um, and if it's corrupted, it will send the previous packet again. All right, let's think about the receiver side. It, what does the receiver have to do with RDT 2.1? It has to check if the received packet is a duplicate, which we can do that with the state variable, a zero or a one. We can check what the packet says it is with what we're expecting. So the receiver is always, it always knows what number it's on. It's expecting zero or one. If it's expecting zero and it gets a zero, then it got the current packet. If it's expecting zero and it gets one, then that means it's received the previous packet. Um, note this, the receiver cannot know if the last acknowledgement or negative acknowledgement was received okay correctly at the sender. So it doesn't know if the packet was received. It just knows what packet um, the sender has sent to it. And it can, if that's a duplicate, it'll discard it. If it's not a duplicate, then it'll save it and send a positive acknowledgement. Um, okay. So in our homework, we'll go through and create a diagram that shows the no error scenario and the error scenario for 2.1. So we've considered um, that flow of events, kind of that timeline is what we're, we're going to write in our homework. Okay, RDT 2.2 is a slight improvement. Um, it, does, it has the same functionality as 2.1, but it doesn't use NACs. And let's see if we can figure out why that is possible. Why is it that we can create the same protocol but that does not use negative acknowledgements? It only uses acknowledgements. The answer is, in our acknowledgement, we add a piece of data. What data are we adding in here? The sequence number, the last one we received. So you see, by using this, we can always send an acknowledgement message with the last packet we received. So let's think about how that would how that would shake out if a duplicate ACK is received by the sender. So from the sender side it sends a packet, it sends the next packet, or sorry, it sends a packet, it receives an acknowledgement, acknowledgement number one. All right, it sends the next packet and the receiver sends back acknowledgement number for sequence number one. What does that tell the sender? Right, it says to the sender, the receiver apparently got a packet that was corrupted because it couldn't tell that that was the next packet, 
So it's asking me to retransmit, I will retransmit. So essentially, by using by putting the sequence numbers in the acknowledgments, we don't have to have negative acknowledgments. We only ever have kind of acknowledgments, which isn't a huge difference. Okay. So we've seen how that works with errors, kind of talk through that. All right, here is our last reliable data transfer protocol, RDT 3.0. In this case, we are gonna assume the worst, that not only can we have bit errors, but we can also have packets lost altogether. Um, we're gonna put in everything that we have accumulated up to this point. We're gonna have checksums, acknowledgements, sequence numbers, retransmission by the sender. All that stuff is what we need to take care of error detection for the bit errors. All that stuff that we just talked about in 2.2. You with me? All right, so that we've solved the bit error problem. We've got a new problem now, packet loss. How do we detect loss? All right, how is it that we can detect when packets are lost in the network? What ideas do you have? You saying like an entire packet has been like dropped or like? Right, an entire packet that the said the receiver is expecting based on sequence numbers is lost. It never arrives. How can we make sure that the protocol keeps working? That data keeps being sent, even if, if it's possible that whole packets are going to be lost by the network. It's like a timeout. Right. We need a timeout. So what if we were to just wait some reasonable amount of time and when that time expires the sender if it hasn't received an acknowledgement by then just goes ahead and sends the packet again um, that probably would work can you think of how this relates to everyday life um, I don't know I've like or send a message to someone and if they didn't reply in a decent amount of time or something again in case like, they just like an email exactly it's the exact same thing as that I mean if, even if you go back to the letter analogy right if, I mean if, if somebody's trying to like collect debts they'll send out a letter and if they don't get their money in a week they'll send out another letter that's more strongly worded um, right to, to get their money because maybe it was lost in the mail maybe you threw it away whatever same idea for RDT 3.0 for loss detection. All right, so we're going to wait some reasonable amount of time, and we'll come back to that later to figure out how we compute that. Um, and we'll retransmit the packet if no acknowledgement is received in that amount of time. Uh, to do this, we're going to use what Zeke said. We're going to use a countdown timer. So as soon as we send the packet, um, let's say we expect to get a an acknowledgement within five seconds. So we send it and we start this timer. Five, four, three, two, one. If we don't get an acknowledgement in that much time, then we'll just send that packet again because it might have been lost. And if the packet's lost, there's no way for the receiver to send back a knack, right? It's only gonna send back when it receives something. Um, what if the packet is just delayed? What if the packet arrives at second six from our previous example, what's the receiver going to do? We're just going to ignore the second one. Um, the second duplicate packet that was sent. We need to space the sequence rip. Right. So again, um, kind of taking it through the minute details, at second six, the duplicate, uh, the sender has resent that packet. Um, but right, but at that at that moment, there are two packets in the system that are exactly the same, and the receiver actually already has the first one. Um, it just happened that our timeout was shorter than the amount of time it actually took to get there. So the packet wasn't lost, even though that's what we assume, and that's the we took action based on that assumption. Right, so we we may introduce more duplicates if the packets are just delayed, if there's network congestion or, or something like that, or maybe we just had a really bad guess at this reasonable time period. Um, is this a problem for us? Wouldn't it be the same principle as just like if it was a, an act that was um, corrupt? 
Yes, so this is nice. We already have a solution to this problem in the protocol, which is we have sequence numbers. So as long as we have sequence numbers, we can distinguish between duplicates. Um, so our, the big addition here is that we have to add a countdown timer. Um, and we have to resend when that timer expires. And we have to cancel the timer if we receive an acknowledgement before it goes off. Right, so that's kind of the logic that's going on, the, the algorithm that the sender is having to implement. All right, let me show you this in pictures. Um, these are the way I want us to draw out the other protocols, and I'm going to let you all do that. Um, so let's look at this operation with no loss. So the sender sends packet 0, and then there's an act back for packet 0. We send packet 1, get the act for packet um, 1, and send packet 0, act packet 0. All right, so that's normal operation, stop and wait. It's always going to go 0, 1, 0, 1, so forth. What if a packet's lost? All right, we send packet 0, we act packet 0. We send packet 1, and it's lost. After this much time, see it here, we're saying that's our countdown timer, the sender sends packet 1 again. It's received, and packet 1 is act. Send packet 0, uh, receive packet 0, and send act 0. So this is how this protocol, RTT 3.0, works if the packet's lost. Does this make sense? No question. Put the PDFs of this up on Blackboard or somewhere? Yes. This is in the book, too, I believe. Um, all right. Now, we have several other scenarios we need to consider now. Can you think of a scenario that's not represented here? I mean, we already talked about it, but the one where it sends the, uh, the uh, act back, but it just delayed. Okay. Right. And also... Lost. lost. All right, so we're going to say we could do that corruption stuff and all the stuff that's in RDT 2.0 or 2.2 will handle corruption. Um, look at this scenario C. This is what I think Lance was saying. If the What happens if the acknowledgement is lost? Because that's another possibility, right? It could be the app or the data packet that are lost. So in this case, send packet 0, act packet 0. Send packet 1, it's received correctly by the receiver. Send back act 1, but it's lost. Well, from the sender's side, it looks like it looks like the same thing as what our scenario B. It's like that the receiver never got it, so it's going to send packet one again after this timeout expires, which the receiver can detect as a duplicate using sequence numbers. It's going to act one, send act one again, packet one, send packet one, act packet or send packet zero, act packet zero. So it's nice that the same mechanism is going to work to detect and uh, recover from lost data packets and lost acknowledgments. Make sense? Um, what happens, this is kind of a different scenario, what happens if our timeout is too short for the time it actually takes to, to get it across? We, we just talked through this as well. Send packet zero, act packet zero, send packet one, but it takes a long time for the acknowledgement to get back. All right, well, the timeout fires before that, so it sends packet one again. It's resending. The receiver can detect that as a duplicate, and it will resend act one. Um, now, at this point, you see, as soon as the first acknowledgement one got there, the sender sent packet zero again. Um, it didn't have to wait for this duplicate act one. Yeah. And as soon as the receiver gets the packet zero, it can send act zero. So this kind of shows you what happens if there's a premature timeout. Uh, the, fill in the blank here. If there's a premature timeout, the system will create duplicate what? Packets. Packets. All right. And it's actually going to create both kinds, right? We're going to have duplicate data packets and duplicate Acts. Okay, questions about this RDT 3.0. This is kind of where we're golden building up to. We've solved both of our, our main problems. Uh, but, like anything, we still have some issues, right? There's still some, there's still some performance issues we need to think about. Let's look at it in this diagram. <clears throat> okay. In this case, again, time is going down. We have our sender and receiver. Um, 
we're going to say that the first bit is a bit of the packet is transmitted at time zero. The last bit of the packet is transmitted at time L over R, where L is the length of the packet in bits, and R is the speed, the transmission speed of the system, of the network. So that's how long it takes to send a packet that's L bits, that sends it R bits per second. All right? So imagine it looks like this. Um, assume that the first bit of the packet arrives here, the last bit arrives here. We can't send the acknowledgement until, at the very earliest, the last bit of the packet arrives. And we know actually we've got to do some processing on that as well to do the checksum, right? Um, we are assuming that happens really, really fast. Um, and let's, let's assume we send back the acknowledgement pretty much immediately. When is the... Well, how long does it take to send a packet in this scenario? How long does it take to send kind of one whole packet? Although the transmission time is just this blue, we can't send a second packet until this moment right here which is the round trip time between the sender and receiver plus the time to actually send it. Does that, does that make sense to you? Um, you may see some issues here then, right? It's like, if you imagine how much, what percent of the time, just looking at this visually, what percent of the time are we actually sending data out on the network? What is it? Can you just look at this and make a, a guesstimate? An eighth. An eighth. So it looks like maybe you could fit eight more or seven more of these blue, uh, this distance, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Do you see that, that issue? So we have all of this bandwidth and all this time, but for most of the time, what are we doing? We're waiting, right? We're just waiting to get an acknowledgement back. And what that means is your actual transmission rate, your effective transmission rate, is this much data over this much time. Not this much data over this much time. Does that make sense? So your, your effective speeds are much, much lower because most of the time you're just waiting to get acknowledgments back. Um, and this is an issue with this kind of stop and wait operation. Um, the author takes us through this Example. So if you had a one gigabit per second link, uh, there was a 15 millisecond propagation delay, and you were sending 8,000 bit packets. What is the transmission time? How long does it take to transmit that, that 8,000 bit packet? What's the, what's the formula for that? Remember this T equals L over R, where L is the length of the packet, so that's 8,000 bits. And the rate here is one gigabit per second. Um, so that's 8,000 divided by one e to the ninth. Um, that ends up being eight microseconds. So at this really high speed link, it only takes eight microseconds to transmit the packet. Micro is a millionth of a second, yeah? The propagation delay between sender and receiver is 15 milliseconds. So how long does it take? What, what's the round trip time on this? How long does it take to get from sender to receiver back to sender again? 15 milliseconds plus 8 microseconds. Well, the 15 is actually just one way. So we have to double that. So our total, um, so we've got 15 times 2 milliseconds plus 8 microseconds. Right, so that's 30.008 milliseconds. That's right. Um, yeah, because that would be 0 0.008 milliseconds. This is how much time it takes to send the packet and get the response. 
Get that mic for a second. Okay, so what is the throughput? How many bits per second are we actually getting through on this scenario? I give you how many bits are we sending? 8,000. 8, and how long does it really take us to send those 8,000 bits? 30.008. And if we, if we do that, this is the throughput. If you do that math, it ends up being 33 um, kilobytes. Um, was that in bytes? I mean, that was bits. Bits. Um, How many milliseconds are in a second? It's 266. It was bits per second. There's a thousand milliseconds in a second. So this is 30.00 e to the negative three. Um, do you see the issue here? What's our, what's our effective throughput? 266K. And what's the transmission speed of the link? No, that's not a... Yeah, it's a gigabit per second. So what's happening to the rest of that speed? Yeah, we're, we're wasting it because there's all that empty space. Um, the author works out this utilization metric where utilization is the fraction of the time the sender is busy sending. It's kind of the opposite of that would be how much time he's busy waiting. Um, and to get that, right, how much time is the, is the sender sending? Eight, eight microseconds. And how long does it take to actually send a whole packet? It's the... 30.008. Right, 30.008. If you work that out, that ends up being... 0 0.00027. So that means if we convert that to a percentage, that would be 0.027% of the time is it actually sending. So we're, we're not utilizing our capacity very well at all. Yeah? So in this case, you see very clearly that the network protocol, the rules of the network system, are limiting how the physical resources can be used. We got lots of physical resources, but this protocol, this software that we've implemented on top of those resources is actually restricting how well we can use them. Can you think of some way to fix this problem? How can we make this scenario faster and make better utilization of the network, the, the bandwidth? In, um, what were you going to say? It sounded uh, promising. Say send pa um, packet before you receive the ad. That's perfect. That's exactly what we need to do. All right, so the idea is we need to have multiple in-flight packets, multiple packets that are out that haven't been act yet so that we can send them in a batch even before we get the first acknowledgement. Does that make sense, that, that core idea? That's what's called a pipeline protocol. The idea is that we've got several packets in the pipeline out at this moment, and we're waiting to get acknowledgments for them. Question? I mean, it just, it just seems to kind of contradict the idea of the sequence bits. All right, so it does bring up, if we're going to allow this, we're going to have to change our protocol. You're, you're exactly right, because now, we're going to need a lot more sequence numbers because a lot more than one packet can be out at a time. So that's the that's what that range of sequence numbers means is that we're going to on the sending side going to have to um, 
know a, a larger range of sequence numbers. And on the receiving side, we're probably going to have to buffer, uh, maybe on both sides, we're going to have to buffer the packets. Um, I think this is nicely graphically illustrated. If you can think about these two servers that are on opposite ends of the U.S., so it takes a long time to go between them. If you have to only send one at a time, as this stop and wait protocol dictates, then you end up having really slow data rates, just like the scenario we just worked out, because um, you're waiting most of the time. Whereas, if you can allow a lot of packets to be out at once, and then get a lot of acknowledgments back, you can utilize your link better and actually get much better throughput. Um, we will have to solve the problem of uh, this complicates sequence numbers, it complicates acknowledgments. But we can solve those. The pipeline protocols really come in two forms. One is called go back in, and one is called selective repeat. Um, and these two general models define what you do to request the packets that are missing. And we're going to talk about these next, but the main idea is go back in says, hey, I missed this packet, I've got a hole here, you need to go back four packets and send me all those again, because I, I didn't get that one. Select and repeat says, oh, okay, hey, I've got some holes here, I missed packet four and packet eight, can you resend those? Um, but I buffered the rest of them. Um, before we get into that, notice this illustration, we've seen this already, but this, I think, visually explains how we get increased utilization when we use pipelining, right? All this wasted RTT time, instead of just stopping and doing nothing, we send multiple so that we get them back. So you see that this sending three packets at once actually increases our utilization by a factor of three. Instead of waiting, we send and let three packets be out at, at, at one time. Questions on this? Excuse me. All right, here is sort of an overview of go back in and selective repeat. With go back in, the sender can send up to n unact packets at once. So there can be up to n packets out that haven't been acknowledged yet. The receiver only sends cumulative, cumulative acknowledgments. What does cumulative mean? It means it doesn't acknowledge a packet if there's a gap. It only sends the largest sequence number that it's received in a, se in a sequence of received packets. Uh, on the receiving side, we set a timer for the oldest unacknowledged packet. And when that timer goes off, we will retransmit all of the unacknowledged packets up to that point. So basically, um, these new rules for go back in modify our RDT 3.0 to work so that we can have multiple packets out, more than one at once. And we do so with cumulative acknowledgments and this one timer that always remembers the oldest unacknowledged packet. Um, selective repeat makes some different choices, but it solves the problem in a similar way. Again, we have up to n unacknowledged packets in the pipeline. But in this case, the receiver can individually acknowledge packets. Okay, so it can, instead of saying, I got all the packets up to three, and it'll say, I missed packet two, which is sort of implicitly saying, I got packets one and three. You don't have to resend those, just packet two. All right, the sender in this case has to have a timer for every unacknowledged packet every single unacknowledged packet so that it can send those if the timer expires um, in case of lost packets. It will only transmit unacknowledged packets whereas go back in would transmit all the unacknowledged um, packets up to that number. All right let me show you this visually I think this will help explain it better. Yeah. Okay, let's look at this diagram that's going to explain go back in. All right, so they call, um, 
we're gonna, the green means these are packets that um, already been acknowledged. that have already been acknowledged. Meaning, this is the sender. He sent them and got acknowledgement for them. The window size is the maximum number of packets I can have out at once. All right, that's n. Um, in this case, you could count this up. What is it? It's about 10 or so. All right. The yellow are packets that we've, that we've sent to the receiver but haven't received acknowledgments for. And the blue are kind of holes in the window, packets that we could send if we wanted to because we have that many more spots in the window, but we haven't sent them yet. All the ones that are white are not usable, meaning we are not allowed to go outside our window size. We can only stay within this range of packets. Um, here's, the, here's the key for go back in. The receiver only acknowledges um, for a correctly received packet with the highest in order sequence number. So it's, the receiver side is only going to look at um, it's only going to acknowledge that it's got packets if it's received all the packets up to that point. Um, so it has to remember the expected sequence number, the sequence number it's expecting next, kind of the one that it's missing. Um, and because of this, it may generate duplicate acts. If the receiver receives a packet out of order, then it can discard it because it's only really receiving packets in order and it's going to get them all when it does this cumulative acknowledgement. And let me show you this kind of scenario. Okay, this is kind of complicated, but we can understand this. All right, so we send packet zero. Right, in this case, the window size is four. All right, we can send packet zero, one, two, and three. So the sender sends zero, one, two, and three. Packet two is lost. At this point, right here, the receiver receives packet three, but it discards it because it hasn't received packet two yet. Um, notice at this point, it sends an acknowledgement for uh, for packet zero and packet one. When it receives packet three, um, it's going to send an acknowledgement for packet one. Why does it do that? Right. So it's the last one that's received contiguously. Um, at this point, it looks like there's going to be a timeout that happens at the sender for packet two because no acknowledgement was received. So it will resend packet two right here, which is received, and then it can, uh, because it's received acknowledgements for zero and one, that advances the window, so it can send two more packets. So this is go back in, and uh, the key difference here is that we're we're going to acknowledge all the ones um, up to a certain point. Let me show you selective repeat because I think that'll help highlight the difference. So in selective repeat, this is the sender side, this is the receiver side. This the sender side knows that. Um, it's going to receive individual acknowledgments for every packet, not a cumulative one saying I've received all of them up to this point, but individual ones. Um, so you see that it's it's not received acknowledgments for this guy right here, but it has for these two or these four green ones. On the receiver side, it, it has to know that it's received some packets out of order and it buffers them. Um, so they're received out of order. They've already been acknowledged. It also knows, you can see right here in the gray, that it's expecting a certain number and hasn't received it yet. When it receives this packet right here, it'll change to um, basically like purple, means that, it, well, it's received and it received what it was expecting and it will advance the window to the next expected but not yet received packet. So as soon as we receive this packet, then the whole window will advance to this gray one because now these aren't out of order because the first this first one has been received before it 
Um, so the sender only resends packets for which an acknowledgement has not been received. Um, and let me show you a, kind of the details of this. So this is sort of pseudocode for the algorithm that's implemented by a selective repeat sender. Um, these are kind of three different events. If the event is the send data from above, it's received data from the, from the application layer, it's going to see if the next available sequence number is in the window. And as long as it is, basically if there are blue spots, then it'll send that packet with that sequence number. Does that make sense how that process works? Uh, so if, <clears throat> if the window was already full, if it had already sent out the 10 packets and that's the only 10 packets it could send out, even if the application layer is giving it more data, it can't send it out yet because the pipeline is, is full. It can't exceed this window size because we don't want too many packets out at once. What if there's a timeout? What if packet in time, uh, timer expires? We're going to resend packet in and restart the timer for in. So it, it's possible that could happen multiple times, right? So if the packet is lost again, then we'll have to, um, we'll, we'll catch that because we've started the timer again. What happens when, you, when the sender receives an acknowledgement for packet in? It's going to check to see that in is in the window. And that's saying it's a number between the send base, that's this guy, and send base plus in, which is this guy. Yeah? So as long as it's in the send window, as long as I'm receiving an acknowledgement that's in the window, I'm going to mark packet in as received. It's kind of like changing the color in this scenario. If in is the smallest unacknowledged packet, that's saying it's this guy, then I advance the window to the next unacknowledged sequence number which will be at least one, but if this were the only one that we were waiting for, uh, the only one that's not yet acknowledged, then we might advance multiple. In this scenario, we'd only advance one. All right, so those are the kind of the three events and the actions that are taking place by a selective repeat sender. Questions on that? All right, we're, we're close. What does the receiver do? Okay, these are the three events that may happen at the receiver. The receiver may receive a packet in, and in is in the window between receive base and receive base plus in minus one. All right, that's here. If the packet is out of order, so we're receiving a packet that's not the first one, then we buffer the packet. If, it is in, if it's in order, then we deliver, that is, we pass up to the application layer all of the in-order buffered packets. And we advance the window to the next not yet received packet. So we got to make sure that we have received them all in order. When we have received a, a group of packets in order, then we've done our job. We give those packets to the application layer and we move the receive window um, to the next uh, expected packet that's not yet been um, received. If the receive packet in is, um, is in receive base to receive base minus one, um, no, no, all right, if this is saying if it's in receive base minus in to receive base minus one, where, where is that on this diagram? Where is receive base minus in? minus is negative, so it's this way. So what this is saying right, in this kind of cryptic formula is if you receive an old packet, if you receive a packet that you've already received and you've moved your window ahead, then send an acknowledgement for it because the receiver apparently lost the acknowledgement, the network lost the acknowledgement, the receiver didn't get it, he still thinks you need that, you have it, but he didn't know it. So make sure you acknowledge that so he will stop sending it. Because right? he's going to keep sending it until he gets an act for each one. If, the, if you receive any other packets, which would just have to be packets out here, then you have to ignore them because you don't have window space, buffer space, to store those yet. So, but so what if, uh, 
What if that packet's not like perfectly in a way? Perfectly. In like the number in a way. What if it's like n plus one? Um in the that it's an old packet or it's from it's an old packet. You're saying it's more than n behind? Right. It, well it will never it'll, it will never get to that point. Right. Right. Okay. So he has this diagram, which is, just, I know this looks really complicated and painful, um, but it is a pretty decent way of explaining this scenario with real numbers. The idea of the, the box here represents the window, and you can see how the, for the window for sender and receiver, how it gets advanced based on when acknowledgments are received. So when packet, if we send packet 0, 1, 2, 3, it receives packet zero, it advances the window on the receiving side, sends back an acknowledgement for packet zero. Same for one here. Packet two is lost. This is just like our previous scenario with go back in. In this case, it was still packet three is sent and it's received. Um, at this point, the timeout happens. And so packet two is resent because no acknowledgement was received. But the beauty here, the difference is, at this point, right here, the receiver did receive packets three and four um, and five. It received them out of sequence because it, it missed two, right? But as soon as it got the two, which was right here when packet two is received, it advances the receive window all the way to the next expected one, which was six, because it had buffered packets five and four and three. So this is, you might say this is less wasteful, um, but there's always a cost. The cost is you have to have a bunch more timers and kind of some more complexity in your logic to do this selective repeat, whereas go back in just needs one timer because all you're concerned about is the last kind of cumulative uh, unacknowledged packet. You only, you only have to send, the sender just has to have one timer. But you can get a lot of it only repeats what's necessary, right? Right. You should only have to send, probably send the packet once. If you drop a packet, that packet's going to get sent, whereas go back in. If go you back in is going to... You're going to have to send back everything since that packet was received. Exactly. So you're going to have to resend packets that actually probably were collect, correctly received. Um, but because they weren't in sequence, they were discarded, basically. All right. One last thing, and then we'll close this down for today. Um, there's this dilemma. Look at this scenario and see if you can tell the difference. All right, in this scenario, we send back at 0, 1, 2, 3, and the acknowledgments for 0, 1, and 2, sorry, 0, 1, 2 are sent. Window size is 3. The acknowledgments are all lost, and we receive a packet with sequence number 0. All right, which 0 is that? It's this guy, right? He's resending packet zero because it was lost. Does that make sense? Because he didn't get any of these acknowledgments. So he's resending packet zero um, after a timeout. Down here, we send packet zero, one, two. We receive all three of them, acknowledge all three of them. Um, packet three is lost. Um, but because we've received an acknowledgement, we can move on to send packet zero. So when this guy sends the new packet zero, the next packet zero, right? This is a different packet than this packet zero. He receives packet number with sequence number zero. I know that was a little complicated. I didn't explain it well, but do you see how in this case, this guy's received the one, two, three, four, the fifth packet. This guy's receiving the first packet. What's the difference between what the receiver sees in these two scenarios? The receiver sees the exact same thing, just the acknowledgement gets dropped. Exactly. The receiver sees the exact same thing in these two scenarios, but the packet that he receives is numbered, num is numbered zero in both scenarios. That's bad. Why is that bad? Right. You've, you've created this ambiguity where you don't know 
if it's the first packet or the fifth packet, and what's the problem here? It's, it's based, it's kind of in this question, how, how could we fix this problem? Um, maybe let's not think about it as another kind of sequence number, but what if we had more sequence numbers? Yeah, don't repeat. Right. We need to have enough sequence numbers where that can never happen. Like that, in the second scenario, this guy should have been a four. We could have told that, a, we would have known that a four was not a zero. All right. So the, the, the book actually asks you to kind of mathematically show that the window size must be less than or equal to half the size of the sequence number space. Um, which you could think about and try to analyze whether that has to be the case mathematically so that there's never this scenario. Um, so what we've so seen is, is, so as long as we take care with choosing our sequence number range, we can make sure that this never happens. And that's what we definitely would want to do to make sure that select and repeat works. So we've talked about some principles of reliable data transfer. We've looked at how we built up from RDT 1.0 to 2.0, 2.1, 2.2, 3.0. For each of those, we kind of solved a different problem, fixed the issues with the previous one. Then we built on top of that RDT 3.0 and looked at how we could pipeline the protocols and have multiple packets out at once. And that really improves our utilization, our effective uh, throughput. Um, it adds some complexity to the protocol. We looked at two specifically, go back in and select and repeat. Both of those are pipeline protocols. But by doing that, we get, we solve our problems of packet corruption, packet loss, and we have a lot better performance than our stop and wait protocol because there are multiple packets out at once. So the principles that we've talked about here, we're going to use next time and see how they're incorporated into TCP. Um, TCP is kind of a mixture of go back in and selective repeat, um, and it's, it's implemented in a way to solve this problem, to give us reliable data transfer over an unreliable channel. Any questions? All right, well, I look forward to seeing you guys next time.